The mid-1980s was a time when an endless amount of toy properties existed in toy stores. And while children of that era had a huge abundance of options to choose from, there's no denying that G.I. Joe, a real American hero, was at the very forefront of the action figure market. The particular year of 1985 would see yet another significant roster expansion for both G.I. Joe and Cobra the Enemy, as well as new army builders to fill out the ranks for your Battlefield Playtime adventures, also, a new range of vehicle options, and of course, the largest playset ever to set sail. Yes, there's no doubt that G.I. Joe was now at the apex of its existence, what with an ongoing comic run, now with several years worth of issues to read, and its first full-length animated season in this year for children to enjoy as part of their Saturday morning cartoon viewing schedule. And on that note, we can look back at this impressive year of G.I. Joe as a toy line. So let's take that stroll down memory lane once again, because we're going to talk about the history of G.I. Joe, a real American hero, in the year of 1985. Let's begin. Where does one even begin when it comes to G.I. Joe in 1985? The franchise was already hugely successful by this time, and yet they still found a way to add more characters, vehicles, and playsets that would be considered as vital for both G.I. Joe and Cobra in the decades that would follow. Indeed, G.I. Joe stood out among the peak runs of similar, boys-targeted action figure lines at the time and still stood tall when other new toys would rise up to compete for their own market share in the action figure industry. It was a fun time to enjoy pop culture as a whole, what with one smash radio hit after another, giving us a great selection of catchy tunes. Plus, some epic, rewatchable movies at the box office for us to watch time and time again, as well as the debut of some great sitcoms and drama series on the small screen to view when our cartoons weren't on the air. As for the range of G.I. Joe figures themselves, let's dive right in and see what this year's roster looked like. While Hawk and Duke would appear in earlier years, G.I. Joe expanded their leadership structure with their born officer, Flint. Someone who's not only important as a toy, but also in both the Sumbo animated run as well as the various comic series available. Flint is usually portrayed as a responsible, more serious type among the Joe's ranks. Multi specialized as not only a field leader, Flint is also trained as a pilot as well as being a Rhodes Scholar. It's worth noting that Flint and Lady J's daughter, Marissa Fairborn, would play an important part in Hasbro's other big toy line at the time, the Transformers. On that note, the entire Fairborn family remains as favorites among action figure lore enthusiasts right up to this day. And speaking of Lady J, she made her action figure debut in this 1985 year as well. Ultimately, her figure's likeness probably isn't as accurate to her animated appearances compared to other characters, but she's still considered a must-have to any G.I. Joe collection given how important the character is across the various forms of media entertainment. The figure comes with her signature javelin amongst the rest of her gear loadout, and the Sundo animated series featured her heavily. She was even shown to be a relative of the Cobra arms dealer, Destro, during the Season 1 episode known as Skeletons in the Closet. Different environmental and specialty themed figures were all over this wave of figures. There's Airtight, who's known for venturing into hostile environments, and in particular that of chemical, biological, and radioactive places if we're being specific. There's also Alpine, the mountain trooper with one of the most detailed gear loadouts in the entire G.I. Joe range. He's definitely someone you'd want to take with you on high altitude missions. You also had Barbecue with a pretty hefty gear loadout for his firefighting missions. His file card lists him as being one of a long line of people in his family with a firefighting background. G.I. Joe would also get their primary desert trooper in Dusty. Right at home in the desert, Dusty is also a repairman and maintenance person as a secondary specialty. Dusty's featured quite heavily in the two-parter Sunbo animated cartoon episodes known as The Traitor, where he infiltrates Cobra under the orders of a secret plan orchestrated by him and Duke. Of note, Dusty's file card name lists him as Ron Tador, the last name of which is the reverse spelling of designer Ron Rudat's name. 
Take note that Dusty does take on the Rudat last name with the proper spelling in the Sungo animated series, and don't lose his hard to find bipod if you happen to get one in your collection. And we go from desert over to Arctic. Joining 1983's Snow Job as yet another Snow Joe, Frostbite. With his large rifle in tow, Frostbite is right at home in cold temperatures as indicated by his file card. But Frostbite's most distinguishing feature is that he comes packed in with the ever so iconic Snowcat vehicle, and also one of my personal favorites as well. Packed in with a ton of missiles and armaments, the Snowcat is often people's first choice for Arctic-based G.I. Joe vehicles, and comes with a really cool cat logo to boot. You had Crankcase, the motor vehicle driver for the Ostriker, or all-weather and environmental vehicle that could be used for scouting missions, and an OD military green color scheme similar to the G.I. Joe vehicles in earlier years. You also had Toll Booth, the combat engineer with his signature sledgehammer. A minor character otherwise, he came with the bridge layer, or toss and cross, which was literally used as a temporary bridge for other G.I. Joe vehicles to drive across. Do take note that Toll Booth's real name is Chuck Gorin, similar to that of Charles Gorin, a world champion level bridge card game player in the 20th century. As we look to slightly larger vehicles, Heavy Metal was the driver who came with the ever so cool looking Mauler Manned Battle Tank. Heavy Metal is quite desirable when complete, mainly because of his easily lost microphone and because his gun strap is often broken off. The Mauler tank he came with was motorized and is powered by several C-style batteries and does sport some easily lost pieces, all of which of course drives up the value considerably when it's complete. The Mauler is a great follow-up to the Mobat tank from 1982. We've also got Footloose, who is an infantryman with an amazing camo deco, though do be careful of the easily breakable straps on his M16 and M73A1 Laws weapons. Then of course, we have Quick Kick, many people's favorite shirtless Joe, who is a master of multiple forms of martial arts and who takes on the surname of MacArthur, much like the real life five-star American General Douglas MacArthur who served in World Wars I, II, and the Korean War. Quick Kick was portrayed as a physically skilled movie actor and stuntman in the Sunbow animated cartoon where he was filming a fudgy bar commercial and bonded with fellow Joe Bazooka over this very candy bar. And speaking of Bazooka, he would become the team's missile specialist. Sporting a football jersey and having both a great sense of humor and personality, Bazooka could serve as both an anti-tank specialist as well as being a tank driver as well. And he looked super cool in his red iconic football jersey, one of my personal favorites. Another great character with a memorable personality was of course Shipwreck. Sailor by trade, Shipwreck came paired with his buddy Parrot Polly. I always loved Shipwreck because of his really cool sailor outfit and he was wearing blue jeans, so you had to love that. Shipwreck's character is somewhat based off of Jack Nicholson and his role in the animated series is a significant one. In particular, the much talked about and highly emotional two-part series known as There's No Place Like Springfield. This is where Shipwreck is manipulated by Cobra into a false reality that he later has to escape from. Definitely a very memorable episode. We then of course get to the figure who, in many ways, can be considered as a signature character for G.I. Joe. Snake Eyes and his wolf, Timber. A deep dive on Snake Eyes could be a topic all its own, but what we'll point out here is that this version 2 release of Snake Eyes is perhaps his most popular appearance as it's the one most often used in various forms of media and entertainment. Very much both a ninja and a commando by trade, he is G.I. Joe's most skilled hand-to-hand -hand combat master. Having a long history with his Cobra counterpart, Storm Shadow, as both trained as members of the Arashikage Ninja Clan. The fact he wears a mask is due to his disfigurement and with permanently damaged vocal cords due to his injury, all of this has become a fixture of what makes Snake Eyes special as a character. There's no way to cover Snake Eyes as a character in a few words here, but we've done our best to highlight his importance to the G.I. Joe lore. And on the subject of signature staples in G.I. Joe canon, we have Keel Hall, the admiral who of course commands the USS Flag aircraft carrier. This is the largest playset imaginable in the world of vintage action figures, and the USS Flag comes with a nearly countless amount of parts. 
With everything from a working microphone, a tow vehicle, and a very detailed superstructure, the Flag is the perfect landing deck for multiple Sky Striker or Conquest X-30 G.I. Joe jet-style aircraft. The Flag is both a holy grail and a centerpiece to many toy collections, and it has been covered before as a standalone video previously on the Toy Connections YouTube channel, a video I encourage you to check out when you get some free time. Of course, 1985 would have its share of rarer Joe figures as well, such as this somewhat gaudy colored version 2 of the team's mind detector, Tripwire. This version featured similar accessories to his first release, but now in a gray color and was included with the yellow Listen and Fun cassette tape. All of this, of course, was packed into a unique looking card back, and the approach here was clearly to promote some multimedia merchandise in the already popular G.I. Joe line. We then get to a unique 1985 entry in the mail-away jetpack and air reconnaissance trooper known as Starduster. With three different versions of the figure and with body parts from different figures reused across multiple years, he did have one predominant color scheme across all versions. That being said, his release year is a bit in flux and it was initially thought that he was a 1987 figure as reported in various guides and websites. Having said all that, Starduster as a character first appeared in 1985 on a coupon insert contained with in the G.I. Joe Action Star cereal box along with an animated look in the Action Star cereal box commercial. Whether or not his version A toy release appeared physically in the mail after 1985 is up for discussion, and since his version B and C releases do utilize figure parts from both 1986 and 1988, it's safe to say that versions B and C were released after 1985. All that considered, he was available as a mail-away offer for several years, all the way up to the early 1990s. And he is a desirable, high-priced figure that collectors do like to chase down. Given the variability of his release year across different versions, we'll baseline this character to 1985 as part of this G.I. Joe history video series due to his appearance in the cereal box insert. Note that this information comes from and has been verified by multiple websites that also anchor the character to 1985. What's shown here is his version C release, which interestingly was his only release not packed in with the jump style jetpack though some collectors like to include it anyway as it helps complete the look of a jetpack trooper. Mail-away timelines can often be confusing, and on that note, some sources did previously include the version 1 release of Sergeant Slaughter to be part of 1985, but it's been cited and verified across multiple websites and sources, including Hasbro's own official collector's book that this version 1 of Sarge debuted in 1986, the same year as his black tank top Triple T version 2 appearance, so we'll cite the figure there rather than in 1985. And it does me proud to be part of the G.I. Joe team for 1986. It's a good time to point out as well that many of the 1985 figures added an up and down articulation movement at the neck joint, although this is not present in all the figures for this wave. G.I. Joe also had its share of small vehicles this year in addition to the range we've already talked about. There's the Armadillo, a name they'd use for this small tank, as well as the name of a vehicle driver they'd use later on in 1988. There was the Weapon Transport, good for seating one Joe and carrying some explosives. The Bomb Disposal was here as well, which is one of the more unique vehicles in the range. And then there's the Silver Mirage, which had a sidecar and was great for keeping the 1982 Ram Cycle Company on the roads. The Joes also had the transportable tactical battle platform, which would be the second biggest playset this year on the Joe side, of course next to the USS Flag. This set was capable of being used on both land and sea, while having a landing platform for small aerial based vehicles as well. And before we get too far, we can't do this video without talking about some of the villains. So let's have a look at the Cobra the Enemy lineup that entered 1985 as well. Three new Dreadnoughts would make their way into the lineup and these three are often featured together in their cartoon appearances. The first three Dreadnoughts always remained my favorite and have a special place in my heart. You had Torch, carrying Will, <laughs> a torch, and some tanks for his backpack. Then you had Buzzer, who came with his chainsaw, axe, and a backpack and gas can. And rounding out this initial trio was, of course, Ripper, loaded with his Jaws of Life rifle and power pack. All in all, this was a great start to the expanding ragtag biker gang that would serve as a support group to Cobra the Enemy for years to come. I always loved this group of Dreadnoughts, and I found myself 
always displaying them together, and it seems that they remain together on my shelf display to this day. And while the Dreadnoughts were a more rough and tumble grouping, the Crimson Twins, aka Tomax and Zaymoth, represented a more polished side to Cobra. This pair of twins co-run extensive enterprises, a Cobra front operations where they employ their Crimson Guardsmen. And these two have always been shown to have amazing acrobatic skills, being formidable in the field of battle. That said, the cartoon showed a unique connection between them, where if you managed to harm one of them, the other would feel it as well. Either way, they are a must-have for your G.I. Joe collection. The twins would head up their own army builder, namely the Crimson Guard, who were more of an elite force than your standard Cobra, the enemy soldier. These guardsmen were expected to not only perform well on the battlefield, but also be highly intelligent and well-educated in order to even qualify into the Crimson Guard ranks. The comics were quite detailed in that the Crimson Guardsmen were all surgically altered to look alike in what was deemed as a Fred series of guardsmen. Cobra would also venture into varying, different battlefield types of terrain with their eels, which was their frogmen that took on missions underwater. Having this aquatic trooper would always pose a threat to marine-based G.I. Joes, making for tons of imaginative play in your toy room. The mouth breather is quite fragile, so do take care of them if you happen to find them intact. As for the cold-based snow serpent, this allowed for Cobra for more of a presence in Arctic missions, and they are also decked out quite heavily for such missions, what with a parachute pack tied to their waist, a survival pack, snowshoes, and an anti-tank missile on a bipod stand. Of course, back at Cobra HQ, the Televipers added to the Cobra ranks as well, what with being the radio communications operatives. All in all, 1985 was a wonderful year in establishing the Army Builder ranks for Cobra. Cobra forces rounded out this year with the Lampreys, who could also be considered an Army Builder if you decided to fleet build the ever-so-cool Hydrofoil, or as commonly known, the Moray, if you prefer. The Moray is the largest of the Cobra vehicles of 1985, and is another that came jam-packed with a ton of accessories and armaments, and what kid wouldn't love piloting around the Moray in that swimming pool they always wish they had? You could also continue your Cobra water missions with the Night Landing, which was great for stealth missions under the cover of darkness, and how fun would it have been to be piloting Firefly around in that night landing in the pool you always wish you had. And if you so choose, you can take to the skies with the Trouble Bubble, which was Cobra's flight pod, a neat little vehicle with a dome-shaped canopy. Over the years, it's become one of Cobra's more signature vehicles for sure. Other small vehicles this year included the introduction of the Cobra Ferret, an ATV that, much like the flight pod, would be amongst Cobra's most iconic vehicles. And it's among the vehicles that many collectors like to own multiples of. Don't lose that small rubber hose that plugs into its side-mounted cannon, and do take note that there was a later variant release of the Ferret in a brighter blue color. The Snake Armor from 1983 would see a second release as well, but now in a dark blue color. This version is much more difficult to find than its predecessor, and thus commands a higher price on the open market. Some Sears exclusive vehicles were also included in this year. Namely, you had the Cobra SMS or Sentry missile system. This came with a recolor of the 1983 His tank, now in red, and now of course bears some semblance to the European Palatoy version of this tank. This set included a towable trailer, which was a recolor of the 1982 MMS, thus giving Cobra a missile system to go with their bright new red tank. The Crimson Attack Tank was another series exclusive for this year, and is a recolor of the 1982 Mobat. Of course, this one looks great when operated by some Crimson Guards, and was battery operated much like the previous OD Green version. Both series exclusive vehicles shown here are considered rare and thus are quite desirable for G.I. Joe collectors. And like other years of this franchise, both sides would have their share of small playsets or battle stations as they were called. Cobra had their bunker battle station, for example, and G.I. Joe had two sets, namely the air defense, which was a simple set used for anti-aircraft, missile to air attacks, and of course, Checkpoint Alpha, with its cool observation deck and guard gate among other features, and this was a smallish playset that could be occupied by several Joes. In addition to the small battle stations, the battlefield accessory sets were back as expected, and the Joes had their ammo dump set, which had a crate to store missiles in. 
There was also the Forward Observer Unit with its mortar, tent, scope, radio set, and ammunition box. And on the Cobra side, you had the rifle range with its small bunker, targets, as well as weapons and a weapon rack. We'd also be treated to a third release of yet another Battle Gear accessory pack containing recolored weapons, backpacks, and helmets from prior years. And this year's mail away was a green parachute pack perfect for halo jumping and had the green backpack itself, a mask and helmet, a soft plastic strap, and of course, the parachute. While that covers G.I. Joe and Cobra's lineups on this side of the pond, the franchise's European equivalent, Action Force, adopted the tooling and characters to a fuller degree this year. These UK releases veered away from the four subteams and Red Shadows based figures from the prior years as G.I. Joe and Action Force would begin converging more and more as we moved away from the Palatoy era overseas. And on the small screen, while shorter miniseries aired in 1983 and 1984, a lot of our G.I. Joe memories stem from the first full-length season in this 1985 calendar year. 55 episodes made for tons of after-school and Saturday morning cartoon viewing, and we have talked briefly about a few of those episodes here in this video. If anything, it was amazing to see so many of our heroes go from plastic to animation when turning on the television to explore some further adventures of G.I. Joe. The comics by Larry Hama would give us some great memories as well, including some conflicts occurring on Cobra Island. And what I'm saying is, all of the things we've discussed here makes 1985 yet another standout and perhaps just arguably the best year G.I. Joe had to offer both in toy form as well as media form. Overall, there was a lot to like and very little to dislike about G.I. Joe in this monumental 1985 year. And let us know in the comments section what your favorite G.I. Joe memories are from the toys, cartoon, or comics from this year. And stay tuned because there'll be plenty of future G.I. Joe related content right here on Toy Connections. And if you enjoyed this video, don't go anywhere just yet. I'm going to put the rest of my G.I. Joe A Real American Hero History series on this playlist that you can click on right over here. Or for a closer look at the USS Flag aircraft carrier, you can look at this video right over here. And with that, yo Joe, and I'll see you all again next time. Thanks again, and take care.